Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to number three of the 2023 Historic Preservation Series. Uh, we're excited about this, me particularly, because I've spent a little bit of time chatting with the gentleman that you're going to meet. Um, it's an interesting topic. It's uh, something that they, in a very short time, have come way up to speed, and I think you'll find it very exciting. The Historic Preservation Commission is created by ordinance within the city of Spencer. We are all volunteers. I guess we could be accused of being history geeks. Uh, I, I, I'm, I wear the badge proudly. It's very interesting. The minute you learn something, you have to go on to the next one because there's a question from that. So let me introduce my colleagues. Tom Howe, he, he was running a microphone. He just waved his hand. Uh, <clears throat> Diana Coppin in the back. And my name is Maureen Oxlin. Um, I, I, pardon me? I'm sorry. <laughs> you were so quiet, yes. Mr. Spencer, of course, what would we do without you? So um, I uh, looked the other way and they made me chairman for this year, so here I am saying hi to you and welcoming you sincerely to this, our third um, presentation. Um, we have two gentlemen with us today who are city employees. They have spent the last year, which is the period of their, of their employment specifically for the, um, the cemetery, extremely productively, and they are just a wealth of information. I hope you have your jammies and toothpaste with you because you it'll be worth every minute of the five hours that we're going to start. <laughs> <clears throat> they have improved the appearance of both cemeteries. They've assessed and prioritized the to-do list, which is significant and extremely interesting. Um, they've sought ways to involve the Spencer public, so they s choose to be involved in it toward the betterment of the two of the two uh, cemeteries. Um, they've done an extremely deep dive into the background of the cemeteries, how they've evolved, how they were constructed. Um, I won't give it away, but there's some really interesting stuff just by decisions that were made and had to be redone because of stuff happening. Um, but the stories are compelling. It's, um, it is, it is the people of Spencer and North Lawn that were our neighbors, our friends, our relatives. Their stories are compelling. They deserve the honor of uh, a neat, scenic, safe place to spend the rest of their eternity, and I believe that we're well on the way in a, in a, a year's time, thanks to the gentlemen that are here. Um, and those gentlemen are Kevin Robinson, who is here. He will be your primary speaker. He is uh, using every second of his training as uh, what started out to be a career in education uh, at the uh, at the elementary level. The teaching dimension of it is in his bones, um, and the research that goes into teaching is very much a part of what he's doing right now. Um, he has had various stints in business and other things, but here he is uh, on top of, of really uh, a, a quest of, of interesting nature. His, his sidekick is leaning toward the end, Ed Lover um, is originally from Wisconsin. I'm insanely jealous that he is a Wisconsin person, and he, he made the fatal mistake of telling me that he has horses. Um, two things that my parents wouldn't come up with. Let me live in Wisconsin and have a horse. <clears throat> but between the two of them, they have, they have researched extensively on what is our cemetery situation and what our cemetery situation can be. So without further ado, please welcome Kevin and Ed. Thank you, Maureen. We hope to entertain you over the next five hours, as Maureen talked about. <laughs> they, they always say never give a former politician the mic. You might not get it back. So uh, very thankful. Um, for the opportunity to work in the cemeteries here in town. Um, our staff is more than just Ed and I. 
So we get asked that a lot. Well, how many people do you have? So Ed and I are full time, five days a week, six in the in the warm weather months. So there's a lot of Saturday burials. And then there's two clerical staff back here at City Hall. Killary Burns is the primary. And then the clerk's office, um, deputy clerk now, I guess, Mary Beth Bredinger. She's also part of the cemetery staff. When it comes to part-time help in the summer at uh, Riverside and North Lawn combined, we have four gentlemen that do a lot of the mowing, uh, most all the mowers. And they work two to three and a half days depending on the schedule that we need. And they are 84, 80, 74, and 72, I believe. So uh, they do a great job. Uh, when it comes to weed eating, um, there's a lot of weeds. It takes about 48 and a half man hours to weed eat Riverside Cemetery one time. And North Lawn's probably closer to six hours. You can get North Lawn done. But there's a lot of uh, grounds work that gets done. Probably the most consistent feedback Ed and I get is, well, what do you do out there? You mow? <laughs> and we rarely mow. Ed and I rarely mow. Most of our time is spent with uh, people, um, whether they're living or past. So whether we're selling a grave, whether we're taking care of a grave, whether we're doing an internment, whether we're preparing and opening a grave, most of our time is spent um, in the cemetery doing work related to graves. So tonight, uh, what we wanna do is answer any questions that you have. We want to give you an overall history of the cemetery, both cemeteries, and then show you a little bit of the work uh, that we do. So before we get into Riverside Cemetery, that's the most popular question we get, I wanna to talk to you about the people that we meet. So I have been doing this a year and two weeks, and so sometimes people will ask, well, what training did you have for this? Well. <laughs> I opened up the paper, I saw a job ad, <laughs> I applied for it, um, and was fortunate enough to get it. And then all the rest of the orientation has been just on the job learning. So some of it is, here's how we do it, and then some of it is Ed and I going, okay, here's how they did it, now how do we want to do it? And so we'll research best practices, we'll experiment with some things, and there's a lot of different techniques that go into taking care of graves. Um, the people that we've met, just in, and Ed started in June last year, by the way, so he's, he's 11 months into his uh, tenure. There's the mayor, Mayor Bumgars. Feels good to say Mayor Bumgars. So uh, we have a lot of people that come through, especially in the summer, looking for relatives. A lot of them are one-time visitors. So just in the year that I've been there, I've met people from the states of the following, Washington, South Carolina, Colorado, New Mexico, Illinois, Arizona, Maryland, California, Oregon, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Kentucky, Oklahoma, and Texas. So when we talk about tourism, we don't really think about cemeteries. But I can tell you that, that the cemetery brings people in from all over the country to our community. Where have people come from that we've buried? So just in the last year, we've buried residents from the following states. Pennsylvania, Alaska, Florida, California, South Carolina, and Alabama. Along with, of course, Iowa, South Dakota, Minnesota, the states you would think of. How far away do you think is the farthest person that I have sold a grave to in the last year. Any guesses where they currently reside? Alaska? Nope. Hawaii? That's a good guess. England? You're getting close. Germany? Ireland. Yep. And she's been living there for, I think, the last 25 years or so. And she has a family plot back here. And there was a grave that was open beside her mom, and she wanted that. And so, yeah, we actually had to do some uh, international banking to get <laughs> the check cashed and then to send the uh, deed back to Ireland. And so that was different. Uh, one other thing I would share with you is um, Ed and I are very focused on the family experience. So um, I always say uh, weddings and cemeteries are very similar. And usually people will go, <laughs> how, do you, how do you make that correlation, Kevin? So when you get a wedding invitation in the mail and you're preparing to go to that wedding, 
in your mind, you're, you're mentally visualizing what you're going to experience, right? Everything's going to be beautiful. The flowers are nice. The people look nice. It's a good experience. The reception is fun. I think when people go to visit a grave, they have that same expectation. So they don't want to see disrepair. They don't want to see stones knocked over. They don't want to see weeds. They want to see something beautiful. So we try. We don't always succeed, but we try. Uh, one of the um, more different internments, I guess you'd say, um, when it comes to cremations, so only one agency will ship human cremains in the United States, and that's the Postal Service. FedEx won't ship, UPS won't ship, but the Postal Service will. On average, well, I've only been doing it a year, but I believe we've probably received five, five or six um, human remains through the mail. So they'll show up at City Hall, because uh, we're not at Riverside office enough to be consistent that, that they would be there when they walked in. So they'll come to City Hall, then we'll pick them up. And this particular individual, Helen Ginger, so her husband died in the, in the uh, mid-70s, and he's buried be just to the south of the mausoleum, and she had a stone there. And after he died, she moved to California with the kids. And so I got a call from her daughter, mom, mom had passed, uh, we're going to ship her cremains, can you bury her? And then we'll be back in the summer to do a, a service. Not a atypical kind of conversation. But Ed and I were talking and we're like, you know, let's call her back. So we called her and we said, hey, do you want to watch while we do the internment? She's like, hmm, I don't know, let me call you back. So she talked to her, her siblings, I think there was five of them, and they said, yeah, we'd like that. So they sent us some songs. So we had a Bluetooth speaker and we FaceTimed while they watched. So um, it, that was cool. They liked that. So they'll be back in June. Um, June is a huge burial month. We, we did, I think, 28% 20, of our burials in June. A lot of it was carryover, sometimes multi-years, but a lot of it was winter carryover because families dispersed, you know, and they want to come back and have a graveside service and things of that nature. But So that's the people. Now let's get into the cemeteries. So up on the screen here is Riverside Cemetery. So Riverside Cemetery was not initially a city of Spencer Cemetery. It was a township cemetery. There was another cemetery that the city owned that was northwest of town. And that's about as exact of description as we've had. So they had water issues in that cemetery. And somewhere in the probably late, 18, or, uh, late 1880s, mid 1880s, uh, they disinterred that cemetery and moved everybody over to Riverside. So what I want to do is walk you through the different additions of, of Riverside. How I explain Riverside Cemetery to people is it's 42 acres. Is there any guess on how many headstones are out there? Any guesses? Throw some numbers out. 200? 600? There are 13,000 headstones at Riverside Cemetery. So a lot of times, Ed and I, people have that lost look. We know, we can tell, right? So we'll pull over, we'll ask him, and we'll, we'll look up who they're looking for, we'll take them to the grave. And we always say, hey, don't feel bad, there's 13,000 headstones out here. If you can't find one, you're all right. Even though it's one cemetery, it's really like five to seven different cemeteries all on one property based on the time frame in which they were platted and laid out. So in some parts of the cemetery, you stand on the grave to read the headstone. In some parts of the cemetery, you stand off the grave to read the headstone. Some places on the east side, all of those headstones face west. Otherwise, they usually faced east and west in the lots. So how a cemetery is organized, and then we'll go through the additions. We have what we call blocks. The blocks are the dark numbers. So 7, 22, 23, those are blocks. And then we have lots. Each lot has eight graves. Some have 10. Let's say eight is the standard. It goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That's how the graves are over here on it yeah right here these are lots so all of those yep all of those squares that you see are lots so now we're going to take you through if you want to go to the next slide 
we'll take you through how the cemetery was laid out. Oop, am I blocking your view? All right, this is the original cemetery. So top of the paper's north, always north, north, south, east, west. That is the original cemetery. They are 16 by 16 lots. The graves are four foot wide by eight foot long. This is 18, let me get my number right. The first deed was October 25th, 1879. That is when the cemetery was, the first deed anyway. That doesn't mean the first burial, that means the first graves that were sold. And when graves were sold at that time, you bought a lot or a half lot. You were either gonna buy eight graves or you are gonna buy four graves. That's why on the west side of the cemetery, you'll see a bunch of great big family stones with just a last name on it with no other information. And then the, the people's information are on footstones or headstones, depending on the orientation of the body, around the family stone because that's what they did. They bought four or eight graves. You couldn't buy individual graves. So if you go to the next slide. This is the second edition. If you've been out there, you know there's a, so we're still to the west of the mausoleum. The mausoleum's not up yet. There's graves, as you see on the map, that kind of go crooked, they curve. Especially if you're on the north end and you look south, you'll see these curves with the stones. And basically what they did was they followed the original ownership outline of the cemetery. So this was filling in every bit of the cemetery that they still owned. And this is gonna be late 1800s, early 1900s, 1902, 1903, something like that. And the only reason we know that is we looked at deeds purchased in that area and the oldest one that we could find was about 02, 03. So then in 1916 through 1919, the mausoleum is built. So if you wanna go to the next one, Anna. This is what this, this is both of those editions together. So this is the first and second edition. So then the next slide is the third edition. So in the middle, you'll see the mausoleum, and then to the north and the south. So this is 1910-ish. Uh, uh, mausoleum opens 1919, took three years to construct, privately owned and constructed. Up here, these dark, this dark area on the north side, those are individual graves. So now you're starting to see graves sold individually. So the other ones are still usually, there's still family stones there. If you look, it's traditional, mostly four and eight grave purchases. You wanna go to the next slide? Now this is what the cemetery looks like. And um, Ed and I have found, so just to the west of the mausoleum, when that mausoleum addition went in, if you go south of the mausoleum, there's a drop and Ed will talk about the gentleman that stopped before, but that used to be farm ground. And you can tell where it was farmed because the elevation difference of the topsoil, you can tell where they farmed, it was lower. And if you look north to south, you can clearly see where the fence line was. Yeah, next. Now we're in 1937. This is the next addition to the cemetery. So that row, we're on the extreme east side of the cemetery now. So this is what we call new, new 22, new 18, 23. So the horseshoe looking shape are all flat stones. And then on the east side is uh, 20, block 24. So even though this was block 24 was platted in 1937, the graves were not open for purchase until the late 80s, early 90s. But if you look on the east side of the cemetery, you'll start to see not very, you'll see a transition of big family stones with footstones around it to more traditional, what you see in a cemetery now, husband, wife, two, two people on a stone, that kind of a thing. And if there's multiple family members, then that pattern just repeats itself. And next time you're out at the, at the cemetery, we always sit, tell people the bodies are laid east to west. So the feet face, the feet are on the east side of the grave. The head is on the west side of the grave. It's a biblical thing. So that when the sun rises in the east, the body will rise again the, the stones are laid out north to south, and the stones are laid out in marker or monument rows. Monument meaning two stones, marker meaning one stone. So the next time you're out there, when you get up on the north or the south side and you look north or south, you'll see that all the stones, the entire length of the cemetery are the same in that row. 
So if you go to the next slide. So now here's your cemetery. But there's still no drive <laughs> on the on the, uh, be the southeast corner, which is kind of our main entrance now. It's where everybody comes in. At this point in time, there's still no drive there. So if you go to the next slide. So this is by fourth. This is, there's a lot of big stones down in 26, so 25 and 26. Now we're in the uh, early to mid 1990s. And then this is when the driveway gets put in on the southeast corner to come into the cemetery. Go ahead, Anna. This is the very first deed for the city of Spencer. Did you bring the book? Not that one, not that one, okay. Uh, so we still have the original records and that was October 25th, 1879. It's a township deed. And if you go to the next picture, this in the same book, this is the first deed that was signed as the city of Spencer. And at that time, the mayor signed the deeds and that was uh, April 16th, 1895. So from 1879 to 1895, it's a township cemetery. City of Spencer does not take ownership until 1895. So then you jump to the mausoleum, which I think is the next picture. Yeah, so this uh, mausoleum, privately constructed, 1916 through 1919. I'll tell you who built it here in a minute. Um, privately owned and operated by the Spencer Mausoleum Company. There were three proprietor owners of the Spencer Mausoleum Company. Uh, an Atwood, L.L. Atwood, um, Carl Fee, and A.O. Aldrich. So Atwood, the significance of Atwood is his daughters married Fee and married Aldrich. Spencer Mausoleum Company owned privately up until 19 so the first city deed well let me back up the first deed in the mausoleum is january 2nd 1919 <clears throat> the first city deed in the mausoleum is july 10th 1957 and if you go back through and you look at the mausoleum deed book what it appears to be and we haven't contacted the family yet that's our next step but it looks as though when all of the proprietors, so Atwood, Fee, and Aldrich, when they all three had passed, Rowena, Atwood, Aldrich, um, took ownership of all of the remaining spots still open in the mausoleum, and then she sold all of that to the city of Spencer. Then the city of Spencer took over management of it. Go ahead. Has anybody not been in the mausoleum here? Yeah. So... Stop in, it's all white marble. This is as you first walk into the two front doors. So 1981 is the last major update. They put a podium in and they put the lighting in. You can go to the next, well, behind the podium is the private family room where the uh, original owners of the mausoleum are buried. All except Aldrich and his wife, they're in Oak Park, Illinois. Go ahead, Anna. So this is looking to the west. And the, those are crypts. Those are where the caskets go. Keep going. On holiday weekends, we try to leave the lights on. So this is last year, Memorial Day weekend. So this is on the outside looking into the mausoleum. So you can see the two fern plants on the ground. You can kind of see the altar, but the, the stained glass looks absolutely incredible at night. <laughs> Good question. Uh, it was not. We currently do have it unlocked, but we're debating about, you know, whether we should or not. So, yeah, if you walk out tonight, it's open. Go ahead. Just another couple shots of the nighttime mausoleum. This is on the end. This would be on the east end of the mausoleum. Outside, looking in. This is the north side of the mausoleum. That's a city of Spencer streetscape. Light matches the downtown architecture, the Art Deco. All right. We get asked, you work at a cemetery, is there anything creepy? Do you hear spirits? <laughs> you know, do you? What's the weirdest thing you've had happen? So here's how I explain it to people. I, this is how I explained it at Rotary a couple months ago. So 
uh, or even before you eat a meal, what do you do? You pray. Who do you pray to? You pray to God. Can you see God? No. Why do you pray? You don't, you can't see him, right? So it's common for us, right? There is another realm that we don't always talk about all day long, but there are moments in our day that we do talk about it. Ed and I, we just happen to be in that realm every day for our jobs. So there are things that happen that, I mean, it's not like, you know, stuff flying across the table or whatever. It's really more happenstance kind of things, although there is no accident, accidental purpose, right? So on this particular day, I told Ed, this is in the winter, I said, today is the day that I'm going to find out who built that mausoleum. Because we, we've been searching, I, I, could, I found Atwood's name all, the, all over the place in the deed book. I'm like, this guy's got something to do with it, I don't know. So I opened up the mausoleum deed book. It was like that scene from Forrest Gump where the feather floats out. Literally, that's what happens. And I'm not thinking anything of it. And so this, this falls on my office floor ink side down. So I pick it up and it says, if you can't read it, information on the mausoleum at the cemetery may be begotten from Mrs. A.O. Aldrich, 435 North Oak Park Avenue, Oak Park, Illinois. A.O. Aldrich built the thing during World War I. Roger, and then I can't make out his last name. But I'm sure this is probably, I'm guessing this is 70s-ish. Uh, but there you go. A.O. Aldrich built it. And he's interred with his wife, who was Atwood's daughter, in a mausoleum in Oak Park, Illinois. Maybe he built that one too. I don't know. We haven't contacted the family. But yeah, this is the kind of stuff that happens. Um, this is the first mausoleum deed, which we talked about. That's the first city of Spencer mausoleum deed. Keep going. So what else do you do? You guys mow? Like I said, well, we don't mow a lot. So part of what we're charged with in, in city code is to maintain an aesthetically pleasing cemetery. So because you have a lot of old stones out there, you have a lot of biological growth. So these are like the orange things are lichens. And then even what looks like dirt that's on there, that's actually a type of mold. So these are living organisms that have attached to the stone. So Ed and I said, you know, if we're going to make a career out of this, we better figure out how to clean these things because this, this is kind of unsightly. You can't read it. You don't know whose name it is. So we did a little research. We got a product called D2 that was developed by the National Cemetery System. It's what they use to clean all of their stones. And uh, we said, hey, let's tear into this thing and see what we do. And that's what it looks like when we got done. So go back. Maybe not. We'll, we'll just keep going forward. There you go. So this, uh, we probably had, this was our first one. You're never as fast on your first one. Uh, we probably had two and a half hours in it, maybe, using a couple different types of techniques that we had watched. There's a lot of YouTube videos on cemeteries and stone care and stuff. So we did that. Um, this was from 1894, I believe, 1899. This is a 20 year old. So you can clearly read it now. It says, <clears throat> it says James O, son of Fred and Ada Smith, uh, born July 23rd, 1879, died November 8th, 1899. And then what's not uncommon is you see a lot of custom poems on uh, stones from that time frame. So this is uh, marble. This is also marble, this gray piece here that says Smith. And then this is a poured cement base. So we power washed the cement, but then we used our cleaning supplies and our cleaning tools on the marble. A lot of people think they're limestone, that it's actually marble. Good. So we were digging a grave for a uh, carpenter last year, and Ed slipped on something with his boot. <laughs> about, about what ass over kettle. And uh, I said, what did, you, what did you step on? I don't know. So to the, as you're looking at that, to the left of that stone, go ahead and click on the next slide. 
by golly, there's another stone. You see it? This is a mother and a daughter. This is an infant daughter. The round one is an infant daughter, and this is her mom. And there's actually four other family graves right there that are unmarked. So if you go to the next one. So again, Ed and I said, <laughs> hey, if we're going to make a career out of this, we better figure out how to do this. <laughs> so we run to the office, watch some YouTube videos, grab our stuff. <laughs> Um, I had already bought a shackle, and there was a harness already out there, but we rigged up some stuff on our excavator. That, if you, the top of the picture is our excavator bucket, so we take everything off of the arm of the excavator. It's all secured on there. So we pulled out the infant stone, and I don't know if you can tell. So <clears throat> this is all poured cement right here. What They used to use a technique called wet set meaning they would pour cement in the hole and then they'd put the stone on top of it. And that stone is actually adhered into the cement. So if you go to the next one. So then we reset it. The challenge with wet set resets is the bottom of that looks like the hole, the inverse of the hole that they dug, right? So you dig a hole, you pour cement in it, and now you're like this. So what we did, we had to level that. So we put it back down, we used pry bars and a couple other techniques. So we get her base level. That's her mom. So we cleaned off her stone. That's the one that was sunk in the ground. And then we <laughs> were like, well, they wet set it. Let's, let's try to wet set it back. So we formed up a pad and then we poured concrete, mixed concrete right there, poured it. And then we set the stone down. Now that's what it looks like. Yeah. And she, so after we do, we usually don't know much about these people until we're done. And then we'll go back and start researching. And it turns out that uh, Bessie actually died in another daughter's cistern at her house. She was like 71, 72. They found her floating in the cistern with a water bucket uh, right beside her. Okay. So the mower, told you our mower guys are old. <laughs> so Dick Mingus, been there 20 some years. He can't really ever remember this particular stone. It's a two piece stone, not being off its base like that. So for years, what they would do is they'd mow around it. They'd weed eat around it. So two things. Number one, that's not very aesthetically pleasing. Number two, it's also a maintenance hazard. So. It bangs our equipment up. People can trip on it. Um, it's just, it's not good on either side. So Ed and I, if we're going to make a career out of this, we better figure this out. <laughs> so we go in and we, we sling the top part off, we do the bottom part. Now the bait, the reason it slid is because the base, the concrete that they had poured had sunk, right? So now if you go to the next one. So now all that's left is the concrete base. So now we got to get that out of there. So we bring in our excavator. So we have a thumb and a bucket. So we go down in and we grab onto that big base and we pull it out. And then <clears throat> what we do now is we put what we call floating bases in. So we compact all that ground back in there so it's nice and tight. We put a precast poured base under it and then we reset the stones on top of it. Keep going. And that's what it looks like. So this is actually, so then we go back, we do research, right? So this is Arabelle Rude. Her and her husband, William Rude, and their five children are buried there. The children don't have markers. But he's a Civil War vet, and he's one of, they're both original settlers to Spencer, and he was a well-known photographer uh, in the community. This is at North Lawn. Uh, so North Lawn, I guess I can jump to the history real quick. I'll show you pictures later, but it was started in 1937 by uh, Clarence Hector, privately owned up until mid 90s, owned by many different people throughout time. Warner's owned it for two years. Then they sold it to the city of Spencer for uh, a dollar. So mid 90s, the city of Spencer takes over ownership of it. This is an infant. A lot of the stones up there will settle. They're all flat stones, so they're all bronze on granite. And just over time, the ground settles. So we got a call from the Cryle family um, through Warners. They wanted this stone and the stone next to it reset. 
So that's what this stone looked like. This is what the other uh, family stone right next to it looked like. So Ed and I did a reset. That's what the family one looks like now. And we didn't add anything. All of that was there. It was just sunk. And then go to the infant one. And then, yep. So then we seed it. And like if you go out there today, there's grass all around it. But yeah, click back through just to get the. Yep. So how long does that take? In both stones, we probably had under an hour, hour and a half maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not as fast as you, Merlin. All right, keep going. There's a lot of tablets that are out there. This is not a Civil War veteran, but he is a veteran. So um, government would issue these. This is right by our office. I would encourage you next time you're out there, it's been cleaned and it looks really nice. Um, but this was our first attempt at doing a tablet style, is what they call that. And they're either slot tablets, meaning they're down through a base or they're just set in the ground. So we said, well, if we're gonna make a career out of this, <laughs> we better figure out how to do these. And uh, we picked this. Um, so this wasn't really a maintenance issue. This was really more of a, we're gonna do this to remind us every day. It's literally right outside our office door. So that's why we did this one. So if you forward through this. So it's pitched about 11 degrees to the east. It's got a lot of biologic growth on it. So this is off the arm of our excavator. We have a sling that's on it, and then we pull that up out of the ground. And that's about four and a half feet long in total. So you can see the part that was above the ground, and then the dark portion of it is what was buried. So then what we'll do is we'll excavate the hole a little wider, and then we reset it and we plumb it, meaning that it's squared up east, west, north, south, and then we'll backfill and then clean it. And then when it, that, that's what it looks like. Yeah, keep going on. Yep, that's after we reset it. That probably took 45 minutes? 45 minutes to an hour. Hour, yeah. Yeah, keep going. Little Richard. So we asked the mower guys, what is the stone that worries you the most when you mow? They didn't know his name was Little Richard. They're like, oh, that really tall one down by 4th Street. We, we don't even like to, they would mow all the way around it for fear that the vibration of the mower was going to knock it over. Okay. So we disassembled it. And you can see on the big piece, there's a rod, there's a pin. Most of those tall stones like that have a pin that they set over. So. So we excavated the hole behind there by the shovel. You can see all those bricks. So what they used for a base under the main foundation was just bricks. And there was probably 35, 40 bricks, old, uh, like the old tile Orangeburg bricks. There they are. So same thing, we pack it back, put a floating base, <clears throat> reassembled it, now it's straight. Then we did a cleaning on it. So this is uh, little Richard. He's uh, July 8th, 1884. And it's not uncommon on old ones to not see a birth and death date. They'll tell you how many days they, were, well, they walked the earth. So born July 5th, I believe, 1884, aged nine years, three weeks. And then you probably can't read it from where you're sitting, but there's a custom poem etched right there. And the first line is, Little Richard has laid to sleep. And then it goes on to talk about him. So this is the same stone. If you see lambs on older stones, typically those are children. Reamer, OK. This one's leaning almost 12 degrees to the north. You're going to get a little different perspective about how big this really is. This is our largest reset that we've done. 
So you can see the, go back once on it. You see how the grass is rounded on the bottom? That's because that entire corner has sunk down into the ground and the earth is now coming back over top of it. Also leaning about 11 degrees to the west. Keep going. So we split the stone, took it off with the excavator. Keep going. I could not pick that up. So that excavator will pick up 4,200 pounds. Normally we would have pulled that, but we couldn't get it up out of the ground. So we just came on the back corner of it to try to get it as level as we could. Then you, I don't know if you can see that colored rope coming off the bucket to the corner. So we're on the low corner trying to pull up. There you go. It's a red and yellow rope there. Go ahead. How tall are you, Ed? Six two. Ed is six foot two. So you can tell how tall and how big that stone is. And we set it back. And she's straight and square. And then we cleaned it. We got all that uh, green biologic growth out. And now that's what it looks like. And all of that is hand scroll work on the stone. It's really detailed if you ever get out there and look. Keep going on. So we did uh, about 57 stone cleanings last year from July till first part of November, then it got too cold. These, this is a classic veteran stone. Um, so a lot of them, look, well, most all of them look like this or a varying degree of this. Again, this is a black mold biologic growth that's on here. So about 25 minutes time, it'll look like this. So that's Fred Green, World War I. If you go back one more. So before, after. So what, what we'll do with our day, uh, especially in the summer and fall, is if we have 20 to 90 minutes at the end of our work day and we don't have anything pressing to do or we've got our, our objectives for the day done, we'll just grab our cleaning supplies and we'll just go. This is probably our most extensive repair that we've done. So you can see this is a husband wife. This has already been hand excavated around, but you can see how much lower that stone. So that stone was at that level when there was grass up around it. And it was really soft around it. It was probably 16 to 17 inches below the grass, okay? That really didn't concern us. We've seen sunken stones, but it was really, really soft all the way around it for probably two and a half to three feet. And we're like, well, we got to figure out what's going on here. So rather than just do a reset, if we'd have just done a reset over 10 years, it's going to sink again. So we pulled the stone out. And if you can believe it, so the, you can see the red stone there on top of that <laughs> darker structure. That darker structure is all cement. So how they would set these stones is they would take a post hole digger, dig down, pour cement, then they'd dig a hole, pour cement in the hole, and then they would put the stone on top of the cement. So all that cement for that little, that little stone. That might be where my water jug is. <laughs> so once we dug down, we're like, okay, can you see the, it almost looks like a smile, that little opening right there in the middle. All right, that is, it. you can see inside the vault. All right. So we're like, okay, so we know, we know vaults are eight foot long. So we measured, we probed and found the one end and this was only back like six feet. So we knew there's another two foot of vault at least. So there's only one guy I know to call, I called Joel Roos. So Joel as a kid would help his dad, his dad said vaults. So I'm like, if anybody knows this, Joel's gonna know it. So called Joel, this is 1965 burial. 
I said, you know, Joel, I think we're missing part of the vault, but it's just this clearly manufactured here. This is a line. And he's like, oh, yeah, you got a 12 piece vault. What? <laughs> yeah, you got a 12 piece vault. So what they would do is they had these precast 12 piece vaults that they would assemble in the grave. So they'd assemble the bottom, the sides, lower the casket down in, and then they'd put the top on it in three sections and then they wire it together. Okay. <laughs> so the, the piece that was under the headstone had broke. It had cracked and it had gone down into the vault. And so then over time, all of that sediment would follow, right? It would just follow that vault lid down into the vault. So we asked Joel a couple, you know, what do you think we should do? Da, da, da. So what we ended up doing was, if you go to the next one, we excavated down and um, so we couldn't see a casket or a body or anything like that. The casket is, there's probably eight, we could feel it with the shovel, but um, there's probably eight inches of, of soil between the casket and the top of where the vault was. So on the left side of the screen there is the good portion of the lid. And then you can see the outline of the, of the vault. So we pulled off the broken piece. If you go to the next one, on it, you might have to go two because I think I got them out of order. Yeah, go to the next one. So we took plywood, pressure treated plywood, and then we used uh, PLC glue, cement to, to plywood. So that, that uh, glue lip is actually on the vault itself. That's where the, the lid would have been. So then if you go back one. So we glued that back down and then we put the broken lid back on top of this. That's just the stone pulled. And then keep going. That's what that cement foundation looked like that it was sitting on. Keep going. So what I'm going to show you here is how we backfilled this, but this is how we backfill graves as well. So we bring the material in, we backfill the hole. Uh, we currently use dump trucks, but I don't know if you can see how close that dump truck is to all those stones. That doesn't look great, does it? <laughs> We're currently in the process, uh, hopefully if the council approves. Um, we're going to reduce the size of our equipment and we're going to get basically ATV style hydraulic uh, dump trailers. So this dump truck's about seven, seven and a half feet wide. Uh, we can go down to a four and a half foot wide footprint with our equipment. It's just a lot safer around these stones. So we put material in there, go to the next one. Then we use the compactor on the end of our excavator. That's that square looking thing on the end of the arm there. And what that, that'll vibrate the ground and get it really tight. And if you've ever walked on compacted ground, it's just like concrete. It's, it's really stable. Now we drop our precast base on there. We get it all leveled. And then we feather it with topsoil, put the stone back, and we'll seed that in. What's that? No. We have not yet. Don't jinx me, Merlin. Yeah, no, we haven't lost one yet. Keep going. Uh, now I'm gonna turn it over to Ed. So what I wanted to show you was some uh, process things, you know, a little bit out in the cemetery, things that we do. Um, Ed is really, really good at research and the characters that we come across and the, the people that are in the cemetery. So I want Ed to talk about that. Good evening. First, uh, you know, as Kevin and I have said in our short amount of time there, it's a hotel no one ever leaves. So, you know, as stewards of the cemetery, we try to do the best that we can. And we run across some characters that, you know, have, how do you want to call it? Bad history. Not everything is good for story-wise. But don't get me wrong, that's what makes the world go around. The good, the bad, the ugly is what it makes. For some oddball reason, uh, last night I was on Facebook, and yesterday was, a pre uh, law, I think, Law Enforcement Appreciation Day or something to that effect. And in the history of Clay County, they have had two line of duty deaths of the deputies, one in 1924 and then the other one, 1929. Um, 
didn't think anything of it. Yesterday, Mike Carlman comes in and asks for a flag. Yeah, I can. <clears throat> uh, Mike Carlman comes comes in the office and asks for a flag. He asks if we could find this person. He goes, I think I know where it is. Comes to find out this was the gentleman he was looking for. So his history is um, kind of crazy. He was born in eastern Iowa, moved, moved out here. He was, uh, like I said, law enforcement. No one really knew who he was. This was during the time of prohibition. He came here undercover to find runners or who's selling the, shot, you know, the liquor and stuff. Well, came in, came in to the wrong person, ended up beating him. He ended up dying two weeks later. Or not, two hours later, excuse, excuse me. So, and the weird thing was, um, he was actually known by C.L. Plummer. But his real name was Lewis H. Dayton. Um, yeah, it's just one of those weird things, things hap, you know, like Kevin showed you that lady I stepped on. Things like certain things come, come and go for a certain reason, you do not know why, but this is what happens. Um, two, um, yeah, he, he, and they never know who did it. It was, it's still basically unsolved to, to this day that they don't know. Um, I don't know when, Mike never, I never got a hold of, reached out to Mike Harleman, but he was the one that actually got the stone set. Um, the, on the information I found on him, um, it was unmarked for close to 70 years. And there's still a lot of unknown behind of who he was, what he was doing. But that's just one, one character of the evening. We'll move on to William Rossiter. Rossiter. It's, a, it's a name around the community you probably realize. But William, he was a World War I vet. Or should I say, and he was a fireman first class in the US Navy. He actually ended up dying on the ship. He never saw combat. Um, the way I read the story, the um, obituary that I found, uh, they were, he went to fill the coal in the furnace. It got warm. He took stripped down to what he had to strip down, went outside, caught something, and died. So William died March 13th, 1918. He was buried in Brest, France. Um, it's pretty cool. He was actually, and it says right on his headstone, if you look under the name, he was actually the first World War I body to be returned to the United States. He was returned in 1920. 20, and he was reinterred. Reinterred means he was put back into the ground May 30th, 1920, on direct decoration day. So, Kevin and I got asked to sit in on one of these historical preservation meetings. We're like, okay, didn't think nothing of it. And, you know, how people are, they're just inquisitive about stuff. Um, Maureen came up, she's, at, we were in the meeting, she asked, you know, started talking about this book. It's called The Death Boat by Lloyd Cunningham. She's like, do you think you could, is there any way of finding people out there? We're like, yeah, there, there's, there's ways, but we'd have to look into it. Well, prior to that, these two books up here on the table that I have, one's prior to 1916. The one on the left is late 1800s to 19, early 1900s. The other one on the right, that book is from 1916 through 1956. There are all the records of who, who's, who was buried between that time frame 
in numerological order that they were buried. So Maureen ended up giving us a death date. I'm like, okay, give me, that afternoon we got back to the office, I went to the Bible, you know, as you want to call it, found the death date, and there he was. So the kid's name was Neil B. Jolino. If you go on the city's website and on our books, it is actually under his dad's name. There is no record of him even being in there. So we found it in the book. Um, afterwards, I'll, we'll have the books opened up. So that's how I found it. It gives you the cause of death. Act, yes. So, not, not so in, our, in our modern <laughs> book, his name's not there. But in the books that... Oh, sorry. Here, I got, I got the mic here. So when, when Ed said his name, his dad's name, not his name, was in the books, so in our modern burial books, it is his father's name that's listed, which is the information that got uploaded into our digital system called Sims. So the two books Ed referenced earlier, which were buried in a workbench in our shop, um, Ed actually found Neil's name in the old book. So... So while we were doing all this stuff and whatnot, you know, he was, if you don't know the story, it's a good book, pick it up somewhere, read it. Um, he was the youngest, the youngest victim out of that boating accident up at the lakes, he, he was nine. And you know, it was just one of them things. The marker you see there was actually donated from Warner's. So now he is officially marked. And the cool thing, about this, I contacted the author of the book to let him know he was found. Um, there, there's, I, I copied, thank goodness, what would we do without Facebook? I found him on Facebook and messaged him and I told him so. One of the messages, correspondence between him and I are up there if you guys would like to read it afterwards. So people ask, who's our most famous person out in the cemetery? We, we, can't, we can't give you an answer. Everybody has their own story. A lot of the names out in the cemetery are common names you hear throughout the community. For example, uh, Rosa Frazier, the old Frazier building downtown, Winslow Clothing Store, you know, and she's got this big old headstone, and she's the only one there. But the only way we figured this out was um, a gal who was a Winslow had passed away from Pennsylvania, and we were out there digging her grave, and we started doing research. And this is what we come up with. And if you look downtown between the Beehive and Arts on Grand, you'll see a, a door and it says Frazier ab above the door. And if you look on the internet, you can see um, the Frazier Theater was next to the old opera house pre-fire, and then it's still standing, or they got rebuilt after the fire. <laughs> Two. There. So this next one, I'm just gonna do it as a whole. It, the family is Tompkins. Tompkins Court, he was a big influence, not a big influence, but he's the reason why the mausoleum is where it is. During the fair, I was out roaming the cemetery. Kevin was gone. I had, had the gentleman, had that lost look to him. So I went up, talked to him. He's like, I'm looking, I'm looking for my family. Stone, it's been a while. He's from south of Sioux City area. And I got talking to him, and he goes, yeah, the land that the mausoleum sits on was farmed by my family. So, and his father had just passed away last January of 2022, I believe, and he, he, they were going through stuff, and he has found a black and white photo of them farming the ground of the mausoleum with horses and steam engines. 
So, you know, and you remember Kevin talking about that cut line on the, between the two where the fence row was? He says, you can see the cemetery and you can see the farm ground. So, I mean, it's pretty cool. I mean, and so after they sold the property, I guess the way the story goes, um, they ended up was, uh, let me find it here. I want to get it right. He, they were the founder of the Friendship Haven Care Center in Fort Dodge. They, they were the reason that got built was because of them. Next one. That's just the other side. There's actually six bodies in the Tompkins family plot out there, and two of them were actually ordained ministers. I can't, um, Methodists. Next. <laughs> um, this is another one of the stones that Kevin and I cleaned. It was like the other ones you previously saw, all black. Um, nothing too special, World War I vet, but he also served on the city council for several years here in Spencer. He was former Riverfront Commissioner. So, I mean, he, he was another one of the cemetery. Next. That, that is his brother. We cleaned both of them stones the same day. And that one is the white marble, and that one was just about as bad as his. Um, aren't they? Go back one, please, Anna. Anna. Yep. Huh? Oh. Yep. Four, four years difference, and he's world, and Morris is World War One, and the Walter was World War Two, in just in four years. Yeah. I mean, so. Go ahead. So this this is, should be a name that everybody recognizes in town, the Pedersen family. Um. You know. Glenn was the reason named after the American Legion, the Ball Diamonds. But, you know, he was, Glenn was the first World War I Iowa kid to get killed. And the Rossiter was the second one within weeks. So, you know, to come here, um, Andrew Pedersen, which is the father, he came here at the age of 19 from Denmark. Um, he was a pioneer blacksmith in the city for 55 years. I mean, he just, you know, it was just cool to come, you know, pick up stuff from home and come to nowhere United States in the, hi in the history of it all. Um, if I remember right in my research, he had an, another son that was actually in World War I as well. Um, Glenn's body is buried over, overseas. They, weren't, they were able to identify just enough of him to know who he was. But all seven guys that was in his group that day were all killed instantly at, when a shell blew up in their area. Um, graves, we, um, I think it's 159 is what we have for veterans out there of the Civil War. Um, unfortunately, save a sad one for last, um, once again, about the fair time, I was out doing whatever I was doing that day. And I see this car drive around. So I, she stopped, I stopped, I talked to her. She goes, hey, I'm looking for family. I'm looking for my grandparents, can you help me out? I'm like, yep, I can help you out. What's the last name? Let's go to the office, I found them. So her grandparents are actually buried on the east side of the cemetery. 
but this is actually just south of our shop of the office area and she was telling me she we found her grandparents then she was asking me she goes i got other family members so i'm gonna i'm like yeah I'll, while you're down talking to your grandparents i'll i'll run back to the shop and i'll see if i can find this other family member you were talking about so I found it and we, I, I let her be and um, through, through our conversations, we were got talking and she goes, yeah, my great uncle was six years old when he died. Family didn't have much money. Family ended up coming the, it was one of the uncles. It'd be like her great, great uncle, I believe. Ended up forking out the money to put this kid or bury him for him. Um, his name was uh, Keith Lundquist. At the age of six, he was shot and killed at a birthday party. Um, yeah, um, once, once again, find a grave is our best friend on some of this information and the full obituary is actually linked to his name on the on there, but yeah, it was just a weird thing. Celebrated a birthday party. Keith's first name. Yes. Lungquest. And yeah, just end up having a birthday party at a friend's house, and you know, it, it's the stories that we, with the people that Kevin told you about them, different states, that we have learned about this stuff. And, there, and there's many more stories we could go on with, with to tell you about these people, but we don't have just one famous person. We have, you know, the cancer center people out there. We got bank owners. We got, ev you know, everybody that made Spencer Spencer is out there. And two, I don't have a slide of it because unfortunately it is an unmarked infant. One of our daily walkers she was doing some anhistorial research and she goes, there, there's, I think one of my relatives is buried out here as an infant. Do you guys think you could help me locate her? We're like, okay, give us some time, you know, and yeah, probably within a week or so, we had the grave located of where this infant was. But, you know, that's the thing. It, you know, if it was during, you know, did they have money? Is that's not why they had a stone? You know, there's two un, unknown, or did it just get lost with time? And you know, Kevin and I, our goal is to try to make everybody that's out there the real again. You know, and that that's my my side. North Lawn on the north side of town, <clears throat> 1937. We said, go ahead to the well. Let me back up. So this is not entirely accurate. This is the plat. Um, this is where the flagpole is. There's not actually a little road right there. And Warner's put that in when they owned it. They put the flagpole in and then the big veterans granite uh, marker that's out there. Go to the next one. So here is, zoom in on that. So do you see spirits? This is along that line. So I, we're, we're <laughs> one day we're out there doing some grave work and Ed and I walk by. So in North Lawn, it, it's very clear. The markers are in rows and they're 10 foot graves and there's really no deviation. There's nothing in between them. Well, this marker was in the middle of the graves and we're like, well, what is this? Oh, okay. Who, who's the founder of North Lawn? Well, it's Clarence J. Hector. <laughs> Founder of North Lawn Memorial Park, 1937. And uh, it, it's really like a big puzzle. You know, sometimes over time, these things just reveal themselves. If you can zoom in on that. <clears throat> this is on the, this is original. We found old pictures. So this is original to the cemetery. We had a lot of questions about the Catholic section of the cemetery. And there's actually a lot of rosaries on the bronze markers in this area. Um, there's a bunch of babies uh, buried around where this statue is. And the, the, the statue will get cleaned. We're going to clean it this summer. But last fall, Ed and I repainted the base. 
So it was painted at one time, we repainted it, and then Ed did the crosses in the middle. So those crosses are actually recessed into the cement work. We just put an accent color on them to draw it out. That's my house right there. Is it? <laughs> did you see us mowing the other day, Nancy? Oh, is it? Okay. And then this, we believe this was put in at the same time that the entrance was put in, which is not original to the cemetery. We think this is probably 40s, maybe early 50s, late 40s. So this is a, a biblical um, scripture there in bronze, and then it was really rough cement work behind it, and then we just painted it to match the other monument. So... I'll, I'll just leave you with this. So I told you Ed and I were trained on how to do things because that's how they did things. And so we always ask ourselves, well, if that's how they did it, is that how we should do it? So you can just back up to the grave, like a larger zoom out, I guess. So one of the most common, uh, can you get smaller, like original? Pressure's on you, Anna. There you go. Okay. The biggest complaint that I received when I started in May was we buried my loved one and I can't believe how terrible the grave looks. Well, it's a fair criticism, but why it looked bad was in order to settle the grave, they used to use water, okay? So in order, otherwise you'll get big, it'll settle over time, right? So they'd, they'd fill it, water it, but when they watered it, then what would happen is a slurry, and that would drop like 10 inches below the grass. And then that takes about 10 to 12 days to cure, dry out, so we can go back in with topsoil and then seed it, okay, and tamp it down. Mechanically, the process worked. Visually, it's terrifying when a family comes out and sees it, okay? So coming into this winter, Ed and I said, well, and, and thanks to Bob Fullhart, our new Parks and Rec director, who's very, very knowledgeable in horticulture, Bob said, well, you can winter seed these graves. You don't have to wait till spring. Yeah, well, we knew that, you know, Bob. We just, uh, <laughs> fine, we'll go ahead and seed it. <laughs> Problem is, to settle the graves, we water them. Well, it doesn't work too good in January when it's 17 below. If you remember back earlier in the presentation, we have a compactor. So we had this thing sitting in the shop and we're like, we'll see if that works. <laughs> so we YouTubed <laughs> how, to put a, how to put a compactor on the end of a Bobcat excavator. And so we started messing around with some graves and uh, found out we actually got a better compaction using the compactor than dropping them with water. Between that and winter seeding the graves, so this is actually the grave of Mary Jackson. She used to be my neighbor two doors down when I lived on West 7th Street. We buried her December 2nd of this last winter. And we've done nothing to it other than compact and seed it. So now, if the family showed up today for Memorial Day weekend, they see this, they don't see a sunk grave 10 inches, ah, you know. Yep, but questions. All right, what's the oldest oldest stone in the cemetery? Um, we'll try to do these lightning. I know we're running fast or out of time. The old workshop on the east side or the west side of the cemetery, the stones basically that go from there east, those are all what we think are disinternments from the old cemetery. So the reason we think that is the deed dates are newer by many years than the actual burial date or the actual death dates of the people. So um, I don't have any pictures on it, but the oldest stone we think is on the corner. We want to get it cleaned. It's just it's not a hazard because it's in it's up, upright. But um, you want to go show them where I'm talking about Ed on the map? Yeah. <clears throat> So right in that area there is going to be about the oldest stones. We found one person whose birth date is late 1700s, um, which we believe is not an original burial here. We think that's a disinternment from somewhere else, but we've only found one who's late 1700s, but yeah. Can we have a walking tour? Sure. Yep. Clay County. Yeah. So Nancy, we can do that. 
you want to hear like about the people or just the cemetery or? Yeah. Years ago, uh, we did have one and Dale Broxus was the old, portrayed the oldest yeah. storekeeper. Right. And different people did. You couldn't ask them, you couldn't ask yeah. them questions, but golly, that was interesting. And yep. it seems to me like that one was in October, but it drew a big crowd. That was quite a while ago. I was still working. So that'd be fun. Yeah, we can certainly do then that. Then we can wind it up with a chili feed or something. I think that'd be... <laughs> I'm yeah. down for that. Yeah. Chili feed, smoke yeah. brisket. Yeah, we can have a chili close, feed close, in the mausoleum. Close your ears, Mayor. Maybe a keg. I don't know. I know down. there's bratwurst out there. There is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. all right. Aww. So Steve, uh, so the mayor, the mayor's doing, doing the mayor's work. He'll come out and visit our department every now and again. And uh, we made a homemade uh, uh, smoker out of flower pots. And so uh, we, <laughs> he stopped by the day we were having smoked brats. So, um, what does it cost? Yeah, <laughs> what does it cost for a lot of two people, and who receives the funds? Easy question on the funds. The city of Spencer receives the funds. All payments at the cemetery are made to the city of Spencer. Um, unfortunately, you can't tip your favorite grave digger, but. <laughs> What does it cost for, for two people? This is a very interesting question. What, what I stress to people is you're not really buying space. I mean, you're assigned a space. If you read our deeds, you're buying internment rights. That's what you have. You have an internment right. And each, you get one internment right per grave. But what that means is if you have cremations, you can have two cremations in one grave or you can have one traditional burial in a grave. So usually when people come out, if I don't know who wrote this, but if you came out into my office and you said, hey, I wanna buy a grave, I'm gonna ask you a couple clarifying questions. Number one, I'm gonna to wanna to know, do you know if you're gonna be cremated or if you're gonna be a traditional burial? Some people do, some people don't. A lot of spouses are split. Um, but it, so like if you own two graves, you actually get four cremations, you know, because two and one. Second thing I'm going to ask you is what kind of stone you want. The reason that matters is if you want a two piece stone, you have to have a 12 foot grave. If you want a marker or a flat one, you can have an eight or a 10 foot grave. And we have all three at Riverside. We have eight, 10 and 12. But I will tell you, if you have an eight foot grave and your marker is already on it, Ed and I have to pull it if we do a traditional burial. And then we reset it after we uh, do the grave. <clears throat> Let's see, Kevin, weren't you the past mayor? <laughs> I was. I never wore bibs to a meeting, though, I can tell you that. Uh, let see, do you have ideas or plans for clipping the grass around the grave? Oh, that's a great question. Yes, so my predecessors did everything they could out there um, i think you know there's not a lot of staff like i said it's 50 hours just a weed eat riverside but strategically there has been a lot of what i would say turf management neglect over the years so what happens is you get areas where dirt builds up the weeds get excessive part of it is well a lot of it is to the plat work of how how the graves are laid out, where the stones are. Um, there's solutions. Right now, the only solution we use is a weed eater. Okay, that, that's the only tactic we use currently. We can also apply herbicides. We can apply slow growth chemicals. We can apply Roundup. Um, Bob has come out and visited with us. Uh, we're toying with the idea in some areas of actually mulching. So stripping back the sod where it's really tight with stones and just mulching that area to try to choke the weeds out. We've talked about actually pulling and doing resets all in a big line of cement. So there are some areas out there where you might see a family of four foot stones and instead of grass between them, it's actually one run of cement and then they're set on that. We've, we've talked about that. We've talked about uh, robotic mowers, um, kind of like a Roomba for your house. They make them, um, you, they're geofenced or they're, they use wire for boundaries and um, trying to get those little guys in the spaces. Uh, we've talked about goats. <laughs> um, goats are actually pretty commonplace in cemetery management, but it's usually more for like overgrown township cemeteries in the country. Um, it'd be hard here We'd have to get a special exemption um, to have uh, animals, 
but they, they stand on the stones and then, you know, some people kind of freak out about them and um, they don't, we, we mainly have quack grass and they're just not big fans of quack grass. They like all the other kind of noxious weeds. So we're going to try to do some things. How many individuals are buried at Riverside? Oh, Merlin. Wouldn't you know? I thought maybe somebody would ask that. They're all buried. I hope they're all buried. So when you drive in, when you drive into Riverside, the assumption is that most of the graves available are here or over here because it's newer. And the truth of the matter is, the most densely populated areas of the cemetery, there's a lot of space here, but here, here, and here, and here, and here are the hardest places to get spaces. Most of those are sold. 25 to 28% of the graves over here are still open. Why is that, Kevin? It's because in 1947, which we could do today if we wanted to. In 1947, the city went through a huge reclamation process. So if a grave goes unused 50 years, you can file a public notice. You have to make a legal attempt to contact the last known address of the deed holder. If after three years they do not respond, those graves automatically roll back to the city. So most of the graves in this area here that are open were, uh, I don't say repossessed, but they were taken back from those original owners. So now Merlin, I know you're a stats guy, so I got stats for you. There are 22,878 available graves at Riverside to be used of those, 13,733 have people in them, which is 52%. Uh, 52% 52 of the graves have a human being in them. 4,268 graves are sold but not used yet, so that is 20%. And 4,877 graves are available for purchase, which is 27%. So if you think about that, one out of every four graves in Riverside is available for purchase. So expansion, the cemetery also owns the 15 acres of the hayfield to the west. That's where the most logical place to go would be. So what other questions you got? When will you use that? The hayfield? Yeah. Oh, man, we would love... Yeah, I, I believe we should use it sooner than later, not all 15 acres, uh, but we're behind in cemetery trends. So if you look at the mausoleum, the columbariums, do you guys know what I say about when I say columbariums? So the two large granite structures to the north of the mausoleum, those are for urns, um, real big in the 90s, right? So cremation is, is on the rise. Um, there's actually room for five of them there. They sold well in the 90s, and they just don't sell well now. They, they just don't. And the most common thing I hear is, um, I don't want to be above ground. It's cold. I don't want to be cold. <laughs> That's number one. Number, number two is, all it is is a bronze plaque on the columbarium. Some people like that, some people don't. Some people want a traditional, even though they're cremated, they want a traditional stone and they want to be in the ground. Um, what's really popular now is what's called cremation gardens. There's many different styles of them, but these are places that have, it's a, it's a, gar, a garden's probably not the right word, it's what they call them, but it's a peaceful, tranquil kind of landscaped area and they're all different types of setups, but a lot of them have stones and then they have, they all look similar usually, but they actually have like pre-ready spaces for urns. So instead of going in the columbarium, you would go in the ground with a stone. 
and there's like zero maintenance to them because they're rock gardens and you know walkways and pathways no most of them have like a traditional looking kind of gravestone north lawn well we could build one yeah we could put in so <laughs> Uh, Merlin, you asked me if I was mayor. I was. So what I always used to say when I was mayor, and people would say, well, we can't do that because of policy mayor. I would say, we write the policy, <laughs> right? So at, so at North Lawn, yeah, at North Lawn right now, everything is bronze on granite. The only people in front of us to prohibit it would be us. So um, I think those niche type things probably make sense. To make like a cemetery wide change, no. But if you were to take a specific area and make it a specific thing, yeah. 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 What other questions do you guys have? Ah, the floaty mausoleum. Yes. It's the only, it is real old. It's the only private uh, mausoleum that we have on the cemetery grounds. It's the floaty family. I believe it's all full except one spot. It sits. It's, it sits right here. So I don't know if you remember the previous maps. This, this line is the original line. Now this is second edition, but the ground would have still been owned. So when that mausoleum went up, we believe it was in the farthest corner of the cemetery at the time, all by itself. There wouldn't have been any markers here or nothing like that. It would have been. And Bob, help me, but what, the Floaty family with Lumber Yard and some other businesses, I believe. Yeah, the Floaty right building. Floaty. Yeah. And they had the Floaty Mansion. Yeah. Which was on Grand, roughly uh, uh, Clay County Bank, uh, U.S. Bank, uh, just to the south of that. Okay. Very good. Good question. Kathy? Yeah. Why do you not want those? Why do we hate are, solar lights? <laughs> yes, <laughs> Good question. Right. Uh, I like solar lights, so I'm, uh, okay. So per our rules, you can't have solar lights. Why is that the rule? So it's a maintenance issue with the weed eaters. So what happens is, we weed eat pretty aggressively around the stones. They have cement foundations they can take the weed eater. The veterans markers and the plant stands are just as hard on our weed eaters, except they're not plastic. So what happens when we, eat, when we hit a solar light, well, one of two things is gonna happen. Either the mower's gonna hit it with the deck or we're gonna hit it with the weed eater. Workers get hurt, the equipment gets damaged, the solar light gets damaged, and for sure the solar light owner is really not very happy. Good question. So my segue into Kevin, how do you handle solar lights? <laughs> I don't take any. If we see them and I'm working with our mower guys on it and they're, they're changing slowly, as long as we can get that light into somewhere on the grave that's not a maintenance issue, I'm not opposed to them. So we, we leave them. We leave, in fact, <laughs> we leave trinkets. We call them trinkets. I mean, not to be offensive to the people who leave things, but like that's against our, our ordinance too. Like you can't leave little plaques on leaning on graves. You can't, as long as they. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, but you'll, you'll see. So like uh, there's a Koonsman marker on the east side with probably like seven or eight things on it we don't we don't touch them if we can get them up out of the way and it's not a maintenance issue then hey you know not not a problem um if it yeah yeah if if you have to get rid of those just leave them at the office uh, kevin yeah i, I, I have the mic yeah sorry <laughs> New, <laughs> no I, I i don't have a question i just have a comment and um really i think the city of spencer is very fortunate to have you and ed uh, um, i i think the the presentation was outstanding but this is more than a job to you guys. Uh, 
It's more than a job. You, you really show your not only your passion, but your compassion for uh, the people who are there and the people who um, are bringing loved ones there. Yeah, so great job. It takes, it takes a team, you know? I think it's in six, but it's a long, like six feet long, and it almost looks like a coffin. Do you know which stone I'm talking about? It's, I mean, it's old. Yeah, yeah, it's a, so it's, a, it's, it's designed to be a flower bed. Um, okay. So we've looked at it, so we're gonna clean it A for sure. Um, B, so the stonework on that has really degraded, so it, it has um, basically a notched connection system and some of those are gone um some so it we looked at it what three weeks ago in depth yes. so we have to excavate let well, me spit out what i'm trying to say cleaning it easy we can clean it in an hour okay to do it right and get it back together we want to research how to do that for sure um, because it's possible we could be better off just cleaning it and just kind of getting the weeds out of it putting some flowers in it making it look nice then actually try to do a restoration to it uh, because so when you get into restoration i wouldn't say what we do is restoration so we clean and we reset so there are there's fine stonework there's you know um we've watched videos on it and it's if we learn the skill we could do it but it's, it's, it's kind of like uh, uh, if you have a nice house, you don't just throw cabinets in the kitchen, right? You get a carpenter to come in and do it right. And so um, it's one of the things we want to do. We haven't got to it yet because it's not a maintenance hazard. It's not leaning. It's not falling over. It's unsightly, you know, but uh, it's, it's kind of on our second, third wave list. It's not a marker, though. It isn't a gravestone. It is. Oh, it is. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we have to do a little more research because the one side that has the names is so weathered, we, we really can't even read it. Where is that? Yeah. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah. 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 What other questions do you have? How do you keep all the deer going? Ah, the cemetery sheep. That's what we call them. Yeah. They 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 will not move. Uh, I've gotten chewed out by more people than you can imagine for taking their flowers. And I'm like, ah, it's the deer. <laughs> it's not, it's not, we don't take flowers. Uh, yeah, there's about ten or twelve of them. Yeah. Yeah. They just kind of hang around between the houses back there in our cemetery and. Yeah, we call them the cemetery sheep. Yeah. Yeah, there are times they'll be out with the markers and they'll just, yeah. you know, <laughs> what are you doing in my living room? <laughs> yeah. What else you got? We appreciate your interest in historical preservation. And uh, what I like to tell people is don't forget you're part of history as well. So, in 50 years, somebody's going to be up here telling stories about us. So. <laughs> Appreciate your time. Stop out anytime.